Okay, you. I will stop here. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. I'm, uh, I was, um, as a matter of fact, Klaus, since you mentioned it, we had a patient visit us from the Middle East for about two months. And we, this is the case I will discuss because it was a SJS patient who uh, was treated here at the INEAR in the 90s. He received a uh, uh, allograph from his sister of limbo stem cells on his only seeing eye, the, the other eye unfortunately perfed. And he also had a transplant and uh, pseudophagia. They did nothing at the time for glaucoma. So we had him um, in, the, uh, in our center for two months. We did a lot of diagnostic work on him because I wasn't sure there was any nerve left behind. We were deceived, fortunately, and this is the pearl, I'm gonna give it away, uh, on the fact that we thought his superior fornix was wet. Uh, we were, and this was in a, a fortunate deception because during the surgery, we realized uh, the superior fornix was not wet. He had an active leak uh, from a uh, perforation that was glued. So it took me about three hours to reconstruct the fornices uh, because you know better than anyone, uh, everything's... Um, uh, joined together, uh, papiber, bulbar conjunctiva, muscles. Um, and uh, once we set everything in place, I had an uh, oral surgeon uh, harvest a very nice piece of uh, buccal and mucosa and salivary glands the night before. So we started by placing that in the inferior fornix. And then um, we did uh, the Capro. I used an M4 valve, which unfortunately is um, is almost distinct. I think I just bought the last two on the market. And I chose the M4 Amid valve because it's a porous valve that uh, leaks from throughout the valve. It doesn't have that little flap, the little hinge flap. And I was afraid that in this particular patient, once the fornices heal, he may get scarring and that little hinge flap in the valve will um, kind of stop working. Uh, so uh, we had him stay over for almost a month afterwards because he needed debridement every day from all the healing that was going on. And the, the toughest part is to send him back to Doha where no matter how uh, specialist the cornea specialist was, this is a case that he had never seen before. So the aftercare is as important yeah. as all the work yeah. that we've done. Probably, probably, yeah, just well, maybe more important. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. All right. Well, okay. Well, so I think that's so that's what we're going to see here. Maybe we'll go ahead with the presentation. Um, yep. And then we can, we'll connect again after. Okay. Um, Perfect. So, so John, you're a cohort, you're a cohort, so you can share so I can um, play, your screen. Uh, all right, let me you see. Can, you can project. You can project um, on the projector and then select the projector as a shared screen. Okay. From the from the Zoom. I haven't done this in a while. Yeah. So I go to share screen. Okay. And I will share. Uh... Let me open your PowerPoint first. Well, I don't have a problem. I'm just going to show videos. Oh, okay. So I want to go to my. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So you just um, share the screen and every video is going to be playing. So desktop. Yeah. So I'm on desktop already. All right. So I'll yeah, go... and we can see your desktop. So I go to my uh, downloads because I downloaded this this morning. So I have a lot of videos here. Let me let's do first this patient. Uh, I think it's the guy here. Yes, Sarah. Uh, I'm getting a little, little stressed here. Can I lie down or sit halfway up and have uh, the screen in front of me? I'll just, I'll go find Solo, just a moment. All right, let me see how I do this. I yeah, want let me just, let me just sort of, like a small intimate group here and like probably you may know Dr. Canalopoulos, but just to sort of introduce him. Oh, yeah. We're very lucky that we took advantage of him being in Boston. Yeah. Said he wanted to visit Mass I near, said, come give, come uh, come visit us for a caper luncheon. Yeah. But Dr. Canalopoulos, uh, you heard a little bit of the background, you know, trained actually at Mass I near. Um, so sort of long history uh, here at Mass Sanier at the infirmary and with KPRO especially, but he's a professor at NYU, founder of the Laser Vision Institute in Athens, um, 
you know, academic, uh, over 100 publications, many book chapters, um, in pioneering cross-linking refractive surgery, cornea, and just very well-known, well-regarded uh, corneal specialist and surgeon. So we're very lucky to, to have him uh, just sort of share some thoughts. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Tom. And, and he's the only capro surgeon in Greece from what I, I know. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So this uh, this case, I in order to uh, fit it in, uh, I think it's a 10-minute video. It's, it's, it's going to play. The surgery is going to play uh, times eight to the, uh, in speed. I'm going to take down the sound. Argument. The, uh, uh, so this is the I'm going to stop here because number one, and I'm sorry, I have to show you these images while you're having lunch, no but uh, I think uh, without us spending any time in dental school, we can see how uh, severe periodontal disease on this patient uh, was one of the difficulties. So I'm going to start writing down the difficulties one by one and show you why nobody wants to do this type of surgery. Um, first one, uh, this you want to harvest buccal mucosa and salivary glands, and uh, this is the foundation that you have to uh, to deal with. Uh, number two, which is common with these patients, is this gentleman. <laughs> this gentleman, sixty-one years old, he already had a heart attack twenty years ago, and he's on antiplatelet medication, both uh, uh, aspirin and. Um, one of those fancy ones. I don't remember the name. Uh, meanwhile, he forgot to mention this in his history. So uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, all of you in your basic um, medical training realize that this is one of the problems we have with patients. Uh, some medications, uh, whatever, uh, you know about this. So uh, fortunately, I had uh, a, uh, a top uh, oral surgeon. One, uh, he's renowned for his periodontal uh, bibliography. So he was able to go in and take that large piece of buccal mucosa. I ended up reading a lot on this, and this is a new frontier for me. And I want to thank Tom for uh, for turning the green light with uh, April coming in from the mass engineer for this patient, and me going back to the books and reading on salivary gland um, uh, auto transplantation and buccal mucosa uh, transplantation, which I think is the key of everything that we're going to see further on. So this is the uh, uh, mucous membrane graft that. So this uh, is the uh, graft taken, uh, and it's much bigger than it looks. The, we use a lot of amnion, uh, and I've been working with this company, Biogentech. I do consult with them, but I I just want to be uh, in full disclosure. I, I make no money from this company. I just give them ideas, and we're working on on uh, creating amnio drops now. Uh, this is actually, uh, they don't want to use the word cryo anymore. They want to use the the term uh, dried preserved. Uh, and uh, the amnion is, uh, is 50 microns in thickness. So they stick two membranes together. So it's a, a 100 micron membrane. And of all the material that I've used, at least in my opinion, this is my, um, my preference. They now have a Canadian distributor for the U.S. so that... Uh, I'm sorry, the, the size that I've used was three centimeters times three centimeters. So these were very large patches, but they'll cater them to all sizes. And we've also used them for our post cross-linking patients in seven millimeter discs that we had to prepare ourselves as a healing um, mechanism. But I'm convinced that Amnion will find a much stronger application of homology when we can use it in an easier way, such as an ointment or a drop because of its anti-inflammatory uh, capability. It's a tremendous tool. I mean, suturing an amniotic membrane on an eye uh, will take 20 minutes. It's a lot of work. And basically what you want to do is you want those. Yes. And you just want those key ingredients to be present for a couple of weeks. So there must be a better way to do this. Exactly. Uh, but we used this in this particular case six amnion membranes. So we use six patches. So you thickness. know this and better this than I do. We use the, snap on the European snap on uh, model, type which one, has a, the titanium uh, backside. And having been in the K Pro game for a long time, I think that going to titanium 
back plate was ingenious. I don't know whose idea was it originally. It was Klaus's, but uh, we used to see a lot of inflammation in the uni chamber, and I think it was uh, part of it was the interaction of the uni chamber and the posterior PMMA plate. Uh, and so there were a lot of sterile, low grade on the phlomidides, which created retro prosthesis membranes, and they were very difficult to treat. Um, and also, we we had an era where some of these eyes had uh, a very slow, low grade fungal infections because we bombarded these eyes with antibiotics, and we didn't realize they were infested with normal. Um, the candida uh, in the ocular surface and it found its way in the eye. So we, unfortunately, I was involved in some of those cases. Now, why M4? I don't know if you know the M4 model. It was la launched uh, by Dr. Ahmed uh, 15, 20 years ago as an alternative to the PF7 model, which is the top in the world. The difference of this model, which becomes pivotal in our case is that it does not have the little flange here. I don't know how to describe it better, but you know, the uh, PF7 has the tube. The tube reaches a small chamber here, and then there's a silicone flange right here that opens when the pressure reaches 10. So when the pr pressure reaches 10 millimeters of mercury, that flange opens and it, uh, it fluid flows. It's very important to prime the valve because I have run into two PF7 valves the last three years that were blocked. So when you gushed uh, fluid uh, BSS with the uh, air cannula through the uh, system, no fluid came out. So immediately that's a failed valve that you don't want to put in. Now the secret with this is obviously this does not have a flange. What happens, this has a, the tube comes into a system of tubing here that makes the whole valve a sponge that leaks fluid. So you don't have a specific point that drains, but the whole valves is a, a fluid leaking sponge. And the reason I chose this for this particular case is the fact that since my newly formed fornices will be healing, and I was expecting a healing storm, I didn't want any of the uh, healing material to go and block my um, valve uh, uh, flan flange. So, uh, and it, you will see in the video as well, I went in this is the, uh, with vigor and a 30 uh, we like gauge it uh, it needle like a sponge diffusing and opened further so it cannot openings itself. in that. Um, and this is how it's placed, similar to so the, the M4 7 model. It plays but special way we place valves. And this is our patient. Go back a second. We place valves uh, nine millimeters from the limbus, not, no more than 11, because we don't want the valve to hit the optic nerve. That's basically the logistics. And uh, and we also want to have enough space in the limbus to avoid rubbing of the eyelids with the valve edge and exposure, et cetera. We used to use pericardium to cover this. Uh, many surgeons internationally, I'm sure in the U.S. as well, we use cornea scleral patch grafts, what's left over from a, a penetrating keratoplasty, which does the job. Although in severe external disease patients, I've seen these very thick patches erode and also have uh, valve tubes expose themselves. And you have to be very careful if your pressure is better than uh, expected, uh, you should always suspect a leak. There's no uh, nine millimeter pressure glaucoma patient out there on this planet. Uh, if, there's no, if it's nine millimeter, it's a valve patient, the patient is leaking. Too, too good to be true. <laughs> if it's a, a, the best glaucoma service, mitomycin C procedure, and the pressure is nine, the patient is leaking. Find that leak because you lose the patient to endophthalmitis. Uh, and uh, it's outside the scope of this uh, to the discussion today. But seven uh, model, but especially I, I just want to give you the logistics. This is, this is, our patient this is the case once we're done. Uh, placed and we'll see 
Oh, and, this is uh, done in a few seconds. Hopefully, he's still in that John shape. Uh, so he had the uh, our surgeries on both sides. Medical school and, uh, so we're in surgery of, uh, now. Uh, I have to open the tarsurophies. Uh, I'm going to use my mosquitoes to very nice uh, clamp and, and squeeze the who was unfortunate uh, to undergone Stevens. Fortunately, I didn't Tindra. encounter uh, All the way back in the as much as hemorrhage as I was expecting. With him being on antiplatelet therapy, we, had, we stopped him for uh, five uh, days. Ideally, it should, should, should have been seven the days. Temporal tarsorophy. But that was uh, we'll uh, see a lot of okay. We also had a cardiologist uh, assess him, and the, he okayed uh, him uh, mild as far as injection, uh, fractions, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm you, going uh, to get a feeling to prepare the cornices. As you can see, he has no cornices. He has ankylobleferon, which is a Greek word. It, it means that the blepharon is glued on the eye. Uh, uh, so I'm going in using here um, epinephrine and anesthetic to attain both better anesthesia and uh, the eye cases. And so this is a tricky part because here, the uh, and the key thing for cornea specialists is that we should not have uh, um, salicane as uh, the scissors that are sharp. So we want to use the, uh, this is common always the curved eyes. scissors. I was saying the patient, and essentially uh, what you're doing here is you're cutting, but I hate to say it, it's the sound and the uh, feel of the cut uh, that uh, helps you know the if you're cutting scar tissue or you're cutting muscles from, uh, and this was done uh, in Miami from other structures. Chang had surgery. So I'm going to go in, transplant the lens surgery with bipolar cautery, get some hemostasis, or this is late times eight, so it's fast forwarded. To preserve the these very, very preparation of the cornices took design. about three hours. For all these years, so we're uh, seeing here a lot of work. that I'm licensing the. Uh, uh, no, this was under uh, the, uh, Bobar. Eyelid, the yes. eyelid, the uh, eyelid, the yeah. 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 Bobar. John, John, yeah. is it possible to turn down the volume a little bit on your video? Yeah, um, yeah I don't know how to do that. Uh, no, no, there is over there next to your okay. uh, cursor. Thanks. Yeah, turn it yeah. down. Perfect. Because it's mixing things up. Thanks. Thanks so much. And uh, so uh, a lot of work here. What we haven't seen yet is, uh, and I'm preparing you for this, on our view, which is the surgeon's view, up at the, you see that white patch up at the 11 o'clock, our view, it's the seven o'clock for the patient. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put my, do I have a mouse? I'm gonna put my pouch over it. This area right here, is the unpleasant, pleasant surprise because this is actually cyanacrylate blue. So when I'm going to go to suture my prosthesis cornea vehicle complex, it will feel uh, tougher than it should for uh, sclera, and the whole thing will come out and block, and it, it, I will find a patch of exposed UVA. But I think that this was the key that kept this patient's optic nerve alive. So he had a chronic leak that somehow found itself in the superior quote-unquote fornix. Everybody thought he had a wet eye. It was aqueous. Fortunately, he didn't get an infection. And we'll see some imaging later on that his optic nerve, although scarred by time and probably high pressures, is still functional. Uh, he, by the way, had bare light perception when we started. And he's currently at 2200 vision. This is the only eye. Uh, we can see the uh, inferior rectus there. PLTK, right? Th this was a, fa a failed PK. And not only that, we yeah, could tell good. that something funny, very good point, um, uh, Tom. Uh, we could see with uh, anterior segment OCT that the IOL was stuck to the um, uh, edematous graft together. So this kind of alluded to the fact that um, for some reason he had no AC. Uh, so there was a leakage somewhere, either in the past or active. And I think somewhere along the line, I have that OCT image. So here is the buccal mucosa salivary gland graft. And this is huge. As you can see, this is almost uh, seven millimeters in one uh, dimension and about four in the other. Where do you suture the salivary gland? I, I sutured it uh, infratemporally. Uh, don't ask me why. That's that's what flashed in my mind <laughs> at that minute. It's not. I try to stay away from the limbus, so I went. Uh, as you can see, it's almost seven millimeters from the limbus. Um, 
there's a lot of ways to do this. I, I ran into almost 200, 300 pages of literature the night before I did this. I skimmed some of that material. Uh, the ideal thing now for me would be to sit in the lab with the oral guys and harvest pieces of that and do maybe four grafts uh, to, to spread it out and uh, thus create a easier fornix rejuvenation. It was, I didn't dissect that. I took it as it came. So it was quite thick. It was about uh, four millimeters thick. And that's a good point. That's why I went away from limbus so it wouldn't buck up uh, whatever we did on the surface. But as we'll see later on, um, it actually um, uh, started producing a lot of mucus uh, so much that we uh, wondered in the beginning whether this was uh, infectious material or, or pus. We uh, uh, looked at it in the scope and we cultured it and it was actually mucus. So there's, the, there's a lot of mucin production now. I don't know what happens if we get too much mucin. Maybe we'll change his diet. But uh, we're we're coming to a point that we're starting to um, to have a, a relatively good uh, view. The other challenging thing here that's common with uh, K pros that we perform in such card eyes is that you you it's very difficult to ascertain the landmarks of limbus. So when you you tree find because our trephination is quite wide, you want to make sure that you're not way off and you tree find this into UVA, that you're in kind of the anterior chamber. And, and it's so old and scarred that there's no way you're going to be able to use the existing junction, right? So you're just making it fresh. Exactly. So so I, I'm, I, I have a relatively good picture of where the limbus is. I don't know what am I suturing here. Is this an amnion membrane? I'm putting something on here. Um, but I ended up uh, putting five patches. Actually, I used the amnion in the end. I'm probably just finishing uh, suturing the uh, buccal graft. So I'm continuing the debridement here. I want to make sure that I will remove a, as much of scar tissue as possible. And this is actually a good idea with even removing Salzman nodules, in my opinion, because dead tissue will help in nothing. Uh, so always, uh, even if you have a persistent epithelial defect and you have a white, a white border on that defect, that's a dead epithelium. So if you just increase your defect, it will heal faster. And this is my five cents on that. Even on a delayed PRK healing patient, you may have to enlarge that defect to have the patient heal faster than just wait and work on a epithelial defect that it has already white elevated borders, that's necrotic epithelium, it's not gonna go away. So here we're trefining at nine and a half millimeters, what we think is the limbus, and we were pretty good. And I will get a sharp glimpse of the nerve, I'm not sure we will see it, which really made all the difference for me because the nerve looked pink and healthy. <laughs> Meanwhile, a lot of the uh, blood that we we have on the surface now is seeping into the posterior chamber, and this will kind of delay the uh, visual rehabilitation, but um, it wasn't too much for uh, it to require vitrectomy or anything. I will do an extensive anterior vitrectomy once I get things stabilized here but I'm putting the cardinals and uh, which are okay when I try and I'll we'll try the seven o'clock, I will run into that. This patch here is a uh, cyanacrylate glue. So it would probably be perfed at some point. Somebody glued it. It was never in the history. It went undercover. But um, as I mentioned in retrospect, that may have been his uh, lifesaver or vision mm -hmm. saver. I I will I will run into that uh, part shortly. Mm -hmm. I will take out that piece and block. It will leave a huge uh, defect right here. So here, actually, I'm just past it. I think 
So I'll leave a huge defect, and then I use part of my cornea sclera rim to create an annular graft. Something. Exactly. <laughs> no more graft. Exactly. So I used, uh, you have to improvise. So we I used a very large annular graft, and I grafted from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock to create a new um, scleral surface to lay on the prosthesis, and that worked out pretty well. Well, this was 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 left over from the vehicle graft that we used from the Capro. So this was the this was the cornea sclera rim that was left over from the. Um, so here's the problem. So you can see that once I pick it up, it's glue. So now, uh, and this is uvia. Um, this is where your heartbeat, uh, this is kind of like three hours down the case. Your hands are a little numb. <laughs> I it, it feels like you've done 2000 LASIK that day. You, uh, wonder why is it that I'm doing this procedure <laughs> on this patient on a Saturday? But then it's the image of, uh, Klaus Dolman, uh, that comes, uh, <laughs> uh, somewhere in your uh, consciousness and uh, his voice, John, you're doing a good job. <laughs> so, uh, you know. His ORs were on Saturday, I think. Like, yes, right yes, Saturday. yes. So, um, we will address that with the patch craft, but uh, going back uh, in... I mean, we can talk about this for a couple of days. The challenging thing the first uh, few weeks was that a lot of uh, fibrin was seeping from through the newly formed fornices. So every day, I saw them almost every day here, I'm preparing the annual graph. So obviously take out the UVA, try to size it, uh, try to create a surface that wouldn't create a delin. So that's what we're doing here. Yeah, I, I, I trimmed it and I brought it. I mean, you have to work with what you have. So I chose the thickest part to to go to the area that had the biggest defect. I didn't know what condition the inferior sclera would be and it being more susceptible to melts. That's why I used a large piece to cover areas that I wouldn't be able to see that were um, uh, atrophic. Uh, so I'm going to just... Uh, so they just added another half hour of the procedure, but I think it was a uh, key. But just enough to cover the place. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if the defect was slightly larger, it might not work. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. And and in in just to give you also uh things that we're thinking about now is that I think that we will convert, based on what Klaus just told us, postoperative care. I'm hoping that I will convert this patient in the near future into a, a penetrating graft, into an allograft. Because if his fornices are functional, if he has a rehabilitated surface, um, and since he lives somewhere where, so here I'm doing a, a quite extensive vitrectomy, I'm using triamcinolone to, to uh, stain the uh, vitreous left behind. Nevertheless, uh, down the case, I will have a vitreous tag block my um, valve tube. So that's why in the K pros, I want to be able to visualize the tube opening. Um, so it, it, this incising the tube, you want to err to have the tuber longer than in your normal glaucoma cases. So you can actually see it through the, um, uh, uh, the optical stem of the uh, prosthesis. And it came into hand because I was able to yag it, open it, and then also recover lower pressures because his pressures, and, and that's another challenge, uh, were felt by finger pit to, finger tip to exceed 20. Um, and uh, once we yagged the opening, then the eye again became soft. My valve was uh, definitely overflowing, which is something I like very much because I know in the end, uh, there's no, no such thing as an overworking valve. At the end, well, once he scars, valve uh, will reach pressures of 20, 22. And remember, the valve 
and pressure, even with the PF7s, is related to the uh, uh, to the footprint of the valve. So it's directly related to the how many square millimeters the valve is. That's why there was an extension for the AMID valves created so you can have two valves that connect between them and you have a bigger footprint. It's not popularized, it hasn't been used much, but they came into play both of Multino valves to put a second extension that was connected in a tube and thus enlarged the footprint of the valve area. Because what filters in the end is the blub that's created over the valve. And that's that's the filtering. Because with a PF7, if the valve opens at 10, then your pressure should be 10. But what happens is the, the flange opens, fluid comes out, and then it reaches the bleb above the valve, which is the one that holds the pressure at 20. So since you can't compress fluids, the fluid within that bleb is 20, thus the valve value is at 20. So you can't catch that ideal 10 or 12. So we, I think this is the part where we will place the um, M4. Did you all valves get that capsule? That all valves. Yeah. And if you do a B scan, uh, a way to evaluate that your valve is working well, I, I think we have a picture of it here. Uh, this is courtesy of uh, Peter Netland, uh, my glaucoma fellowship here with Peter. And I think I trained with everybody at the time. <laughs> it was Peter Netland, uh, Ben Dreyer, and then uh, Tom Hutchinson, uh, Bellows, and Shingleton, and David Walton from uh, the consultant side. So at the time, the glaucoma fellowship was with all the glaucoma specialists. So this is the M4. Uh, nothing uh, different than the MP4, the, the PF7, rather, I'm sorry, that you're using now, though it's bulkier in size and it's all kind of a, a sponge material. So the tube comes in and the whole thing kind of leaks. So I can't get to nine millimeters. I'm close to seven. Everything is really scarred behind. This is not the ideal position for me, but at least I'm not at six. It is. It, it's the, the difficulty with the M4 is that it's much thicker. So it, it takes a lot of space. But the advantage is that the whole structure leaks. So you're not worried that a part of it will scar. A little safer. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are studies that compare the M4 to the PF7 because I want to make sure. I realize that it's not being used anymore. And here I'm going cars plana. So I'm not at, uh, I'm almost at four millimeters. I'm not at the classic uh, area that we use valves, which is right at the uh, limbal border. And of course the patch craft is, is giving us a thousand uh, uses. So I'm also gonna use it as a, as a, as a patch for my uh, tube there. And uh, so we were talking about the M4s. Unfortunately, it never became popular, and it's it's almost distinct. I think I bought the last two pieces that were available from New World uh, Medical in California. So now we're starting the uh, Amnion Expedition. So basically here, I'm just going to put on uh, five Amnion membranes at each quadrant and an extra one over the uh, valve because what I'm trying to do is since I'm expecting all the healing process, I wanna make sure that there's some anti-inflammatory um, uh, foundation there. And um, before my um, buccal mucosa graft kicks in and starts pr producing mucin, that will able to maintain the fornices. And I got really discouraged the first few days when I saw that there was uh, actual scab covering the um, the surface of the bandage lens and under the bandage lens. That was another problem, sizing the bandage, bandage lens, because in this particular case, it left a lot of space between the lens and the prosthesis, so there was a lot of material accumulating there. And since I redid the tarsorophies, I didn't have much leverage to go in and wash that out or rinse that out. 
So I'm going to, um, in lieu of time, let me flow through this and see if there's anything important here. So the tube, once I'm done, is somewhere over here, the tube opening. I use a 19 millimeter lens, although here the contour 16 millimeter would have been ideal. I use the 19 because I use a lot of amnion and I wanted to cover the amnion as well. Um, and then I, I used the uh, 5 nylon to perform these very uh, generous service because as I realized a month down the line, he also has a very little muscular function from both the levator and uh, the uh, orbicularis uh, on both lower and um, upper eyelids. So there's very little muscle activity to, um, blink. to blink. Exactly. Thank you. So this is us done. Now, uh, this is uh, very encouraging because we have a unichamber that's... Uh, we're looking for choroidals in the early uh, valve period. Um, and uh, let me see if I have any of the post ups here. I don't. I'll have them in my next video. So the next video is the part two. No, I won't do this. This. All right, and thank you. I'm going to do this again here. And uh, so let's see what we did afterwards. So we are, uh, this is a laser center in Athens. Okay, so let's go and look at the K-Pro. So this is how it looks with UBM, uh, rather um, the anterior segment OCT. What I don't like here is I don't like the fact that, um, let me freeze this. This is not snug onto the uh, uh, PMMA front plate. But I'm hoping that uh, there will be some cornea edema that will fill this gap here. But this, this is uh, the day after. So this is what I don't like initially. Uh, I like the fact that the procedure plate is, is in good shape. Um, it, it, it fits a good point as well. Uh, it fits very well against the stem. Um, so our trephination uh, with the three millimeter derm um, tree fine is still at play. This is the picture that we uh, saw every day that I saw him after the procedure. So every day I had all this scabbing that I had to go carefully and debris. Uh, and this went on for almost two weeks. But uh, fortunately, um, as we will see further on, it didn't involve fornices. And this is a week after uh, seeing a lot of mucin uh, being produced. So maybe uh, we overdid it with our uh, buccomucosa and salivary uh, gland uh, graft. But, uh, you know, this was the first one for me. <laughs> so I don't want to... I want to. I don't want to present myself as an expert on this, but um, it's, better, it's better to be producing too much than nothing. Exactly. Exactly, and uh, this is uh, the difficulty that I mentioned with this particular bandage lens: too much space between the lens, and yes, well, we exchanged it a lot, and there was enough space here to put the lens in. Also, I realized that I should have had placed another suture here. This was too much of a of a papiber fissure opening left behind. Uh, this is the tube blocked with uh, vitreous, and uh, it's also a little bit uh, heme-colored. Uh, and this is uh, a better image of it here, maybe. Let me... Okay. And the pressure's here. See also where the tube position is. See how when the pressures increase, the unit chamber bloats, so the um, tube retracts a little bit, uh, and we'll compare it with uh, further on images. So fortunately, I have a, a clear enough surface that I can yag this, and um, we yagged it, and this is 
This is right after yanging it, so you can tell the difference that now the tube is clear, and already the tube has moved forward a little bit towards the right. So the pressure is decompressed, and this is the actual tube position afterwards, like a week or two later. See how the tube has moved quite a bit because the, the uh, eye has deflated a little bit, and his pressures at this point are under 10. So he's a little bit of hypotonic, but I. It doesn't. Surprisingly, even if the tube is right in the middle, it won't block his vision. What was the VA for this patient? This at this point, he's at 2200, but we expect him to have a full recovery because we were able to image, I think I have it in this video, the macula and the optic nerve, and they look good. Um, uh, so we expect, uh, better results long-term here. This is what I'm most proud of, of this year. I'm going to use a cotton swab and go all the way around and establish that there is fornix. Let me play that again. This gives me immense satisfaction. I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, this was before we went in, he was going to leave. So let's watch this here after the static picture. So I'm going to use a sterile cotton swab, and I'm going to go all around. So we're about a month out, and we have 360 degrees uh, fornix. Uh, and then I'm going to clean the surface because now the caper surface has this dense. See where the valve position is now and how the valve opening is 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 uh, patent and there's no threatening material around. Mm -hmm. I expect the valve, the tube uh, edge to retract a little bit more as his pressures will probably reach 20 and maybe higher. So we should always keep in mind that this is a glaucoma patient until proven otherwise long term. So I, I just released the... the um, Pressurophys, I'm going to put a speculum and I'm going to come in and see the edges of the prosthesis where all this newly sebum mucus is covering the capro, but everything looks uh, in good shape. And essentially what I'm going to do here is I'm going to replenish the amnion. So I'm just going to put in another five amnion membranes because this was my farewell. I'm going to use methocellulose to bloat the fornices 360 degrees. And uh, essentially, I'm going to carefully try and use these uh, eyelid retractors as uh, pushing instruments and use tenon nylon a uh, little far away from the, the limbus, kind of millimeter distal to the limbus to just uh, approximately attach the uh, the amnion. The I'm sorry? He had uh, dis discontinued the plate medication again for a week before we did this second procedure. And this was performed in the end of February. I think it's February 29th. So it's just a little over a month ago. And he's planning on visiting us in uh, a couple of weeks. So I was expecting more blood while during that. Yes, it's already, um, that's a very good point. So can you do that? So you're putting some sutures like near the limbus. Are you are you also putting it on the cubicle uh, cot or like no? Okay, no, just... I'm just letting him loose yeah. to hang in there. Hang it down. So I'm just pushing him with my instrument and and trying to kind of have him fit into the fornix, and uh, hopefully uh, they won't come out. They will melt away, as you yeah. mentioned. They'll give me a month, two months of. Uh, anti-fibrotic uh, activity. Um, and uh, if he had stayed or he was local, I would probably not do this step, but I, it was him traveling again far away and wanted, wanting to put in this extra anti-inflammatory. Um, so in essence, we're going to, I want to fast forward this, put in five more amnion patches, and these are three times three centimeter. And we're gonna see some post-op images. But we will all agree that this is starting to look nicer. Yeah, yeah it's an eye and uh, 
We're going to see some interesting images here. I this I put it at 19 lens again, but I changed it for, uh, I think I used just a normal 14.2 diameter uh, contact lens. Uh, this time I'm doing a more vigorous tarsography, both temporally and uh, nasally to leave uh, less of an exposure. I ref I freshened up the um, the eyelid uh, borders. Uh, and this is him now with the flatter lens. So see how the lens is touching on most part of the prosthesis. The tube opening is uh, patent. I expect this to retract a little bit more. The optic nerve has definitely glaucomas. There's damage, but um, on his uh, ganglion cell imaging, you can see on the optus image that the tube is in there, but it's not obstructing his vision. He's not seeing it in his field. And this is, uh, he has some um, hypotony um, signs on his retina, uh, but this is the optimal news that although there appears to be some glaucomatous damage, or this could be um, heme debris laying on the macula because there was some heme that just um, sat there and and stayed on the macula. There is some nerve to work with. So at mm -hmm. least this is not a pale white nerve. And I've unfortunately come to encounter that. Do all this work. And this is the medications that we left him with. And of course, um, we gave him a IV uh, dust of uh, Vanco and... Uh, instructions how to prepare it and uh, uh, cephalosporin and uh, Vigamox. Um, what else? Tears. This is a chlorophenical dexamethasone combination. We don't have uh, prednisolone acetate in uh, Europe. Suspension. We don't have it. So we use uh, dexamethasone, which is pretty much at par. And it's not a suspension. It's a solution. So it's a little bit easier for patients to use. So, um, so that's it. Amazing game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, great. Thank you. Yes. Great, John. That was that was an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, is this trying to uh, fit into Klaus's shoes? They're very big uh, for me, but. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, is Sarah, Sarah, can you help unmute possibly? Yeah. John, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Klaus. Thank you. Well, you first of all, congratulations uh, to a, a lovely rescue there. Um, you were, of course, uh, lucky that you had a good nerve to, to uh, preserve. Yes, of uh, course. And I wonder the, the leak that you had before the operation, so that you can, uh, had that, that lasted for many years. It probably was an fistula, and it has been brought down the, the pressure to very good. We've had patients uh, with a pressure of five or something like that for decades, yes. and uh, it can totally cop, cop nerve with 20 25 vision. So uh, the, uh, the leaks that you had to begin with. It may have helped you. Yeah. That's I, my question. I, I agree, Klaus. I think that's what saved the patient's vision all these years because he had the the original transplant sometimes in the 90s, 90 from uh, Ken Kenyon. Ken did his transplant in 96, I think, or 95. So he had no other major procedure since then uh, and no glaucoma procedure. He was on... Um, uh, prostaglandin only. So I think he used um, uh, monoprost uh, at bedtime. That that was the only uh, glaucoma medication he was using. And of course, my concern uh, to echo your comment was uh, what nerve is it that we're going to find? I tried to ascertain that with uh, projections because he had very poor projections because of the uh, scarring and uh, I was very encouraged to see that uh, he had, uh, of course, uh, nasal projections, but uh, he had central projections as well. It was very discouraging for me before I started that he could not discriminate between red color and green when I used uh, 
a, a green flashlight and a red flashlight, which tells me that the macular function may not have been at the level that I wanted. But having central projections to light uh, gave me a clue that there was a little bit of optic nerve there still alive. Um, the leak that we uh, discovered interoperably was probably from the uh, patch of uh, cyanacrylate that was left behind. It was probably leaking somewhere around it. And that was that uh, gave the impression that the uh, superior fornix was wet where there was no fornix and uh, probably kept his pressure at some kind of a balance. Both Terrence and I were just... <laughs> Thank you. We were just talking about, Elteris has like a, 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 a minimally invasive model of a capro and we did a, we did it in a rabbit and like the angle, there's some nuances there, but basically the angle was totally gone, but yet he was finding that the pressure was, you know, actually good. And I think that there was a little bit of a leak around the capro stem, which saved, which probably saved things as well. So then we were thinking, yeah, I combine a capro, you know, to avoid having to put a separate valve, could you somehow like, you know, have a, a combine them? But so anyway. I, I think, I think unless you have an infection in the eye, this can work like a, like a valve so or yes. doing a trabeculectomy or some kind of a filtrating procedure. So the, the, the concern will be if this eye ha, had acquired an infection, which didn't. And I think over time, if there's, if there was a continuous leak and the pressure was low, it may have or it should have helped. And the reason I say that is in this uh, heavily um, inflamed eyes or eyes that have been through other procedures, the threshold of RGC um, um, uh, sustainability goes down. So let's say that, you know, the normogram say that the uh, normal pressure is up to 21 millimeters of mercury. And this is for normal pa patients. Once you have an insult, and you set up a completely new, different um, neuroinflammatory um, background of the of the neuro retina, mostly through the neuroglia remodeling. Then this threshold goes down, and how down it goes, no one knows. I think it's patient specific, but all studies so far have shown that although pressure elevation is not necessarily the driving factor for glaucoma, because you have. 50% of the patients being normal tensive, still lowering the pressure will be uh, beneficial in terms of regression or progression of, yeah. of glaucoma. So I think how it works is probably um, provided uh, a retained the neuronal real estate from neurons that will have died over time. And um, uh, I think this is a good lesson. I think this is a clinical outcome that it's also a good lesson that um, you know, pressure has to be uh, treated very, very early, even before capro in these patients. Otherwise, it's capro becomes futile. Thank Dr. Kenyon. Yes. For doing that. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. And uh, no, I think, uh, let's say, you're making a very good point. And uh, it will be ingenious if you can have uh, a, uh, a valve system in the future capro. I mean, this is the work you guys are going to do uh, over the next year, I hope. <laughs> in uh mass near uh, timing because uh it will and uh theoretically if the technology is there i think nobody can uh, can look into this better than you uh lift that is uh this uh, valve could also be your uh, your biometric uh, measurement device for intracular pressure and if if the valve is uh, is built to only work uh one way then you will also uh, have a deterrent for infection because you have a if you have yes. constant flow of aqueous coming in from in to out and there's no way for uh, microbes to go from outside inside you you hit uh, three birds with one stone yeah. you have good pressure yeah. you can monitor the flow uh, you can monitor also intra chamber uh, kinases and potential material yeah. that you want to learn about what happens in these yeah. patients. Uh, I mean, the, it opens up a whole new world of uh, areas to uh, to look into. So, John, the approach, I think, is exactly as you said, uh, but, but we have, like, two different arms. One is the inflammatory arm, 
which regardless of the pressure, we want to generate uh, a K-Pro that is less invasive, uh, anatomically retained, obviously, not just you know, minimally invasive, that will not cause this inflammatory response regardless of the pressure. And the second area is, as you said, if we can combine something that can actually um, facilitate um, uh, reduction of the pressure in eyes that will have an elevation, that's going to be even better. But I think our first aim is to address the inflammatory component. And so far, what we have seen with these um, eyes is that the pressure doesn't go up also, not just because we may have caused some um, shunting of the acosumor, which could be from the thinning of the, of the corner, but because the angle is unaffected. So you have a 360 open angle. That's good. Uh, so the, the aqueous humor flows, and at the same time, you don't have any um, inflammatory insult to the retina. So I, I think gradually, I think we need clinical data, as you presented now, because we can get so far with animals, but we need the clinical data, even if these are serendipity, like um, out of a surgery, just, um, uh, you know, something that you just saw, that this is very critical in our decision-making later on. So I may I may just sort of we'll call it here just for everybody's timing. Um, so you know, if you almost thank you. Thank sure, you, you can call me John, presenting. please. I have, I have trouble. I can't. I have, no, you have to. Doing it. You have it. to. When, when, when Klaus yeah. told me when I called him the second time, Doctor Dolman, he said <laughs> it's Klaus. Okay. All right. uh, if, if, <laughs> if if I could call okay. Klaus, Klaus, okay. then you all can right. definitely call me All John. Right. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> well, thank you. We'll, what we'll do is we'll set up we'll set up a call in a little yeah. bit okay. and then i'll show john around here a little bit okay we'll talk and then we'll uh regroup later. all right thanks thanks so much perfect thank, thank you for so coming much. see you let's uh uh jet me an email i'll send you my uh phone etc it'd be it'd be great to catch up and uh, look us up you. next time you come to greece uh well uh, i'm coming over here i'm going to course where i am okay. from Okay, but uh, maybe 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 I can come over also in Athens for a seminar or uh, something, and uh, we can meet up. We'll we'll set up uh, if you're in Athens, even for a few hours, we'll set up something in our center, and uh, uh, would love to have you come and uh, give us a glimpse into the scientific world that we're uh, ignorant about. I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Great. Bye. Call me this afternoon. Yes, yes. We'll give you a call in a little bit. All right. Great. All right. Cool. Incredible. Great.